Thank you very much. I feel it's I who should be clapping you rather than the other way round. I'm not quite sure if I'm correct in saying that you are establishing the 35th national network for basic income, but it's something like that. And we've just celebrated the 30th anniversary of establishing Bien, which we did in September of 1986. And we had a reunion recently, and Annie and I were there with other founder members. And we've been through a very interesting journey so far. For many years, those of us proposing a basic income were regarded as a little strange, mad, bad, and dangerous to know, uh, unrealistic, utopian, various other insults much stronger than that. But in the last two years in particular, something dramatic has happened, something in the water out there. We've suddenly become respectable and we're gaining converts every day around the world and including Nobel Prize winners, leading politicians, even Barack Obama recently said that he was convinced that we're going to be talking about introducing a basic income in the very near future. I don't think uh, his successor would understand the meaning of it, but you know, there are a lot of other things he doesn't stand, understand the meaning of. Now, it's fascinating to see how our debate around basic income has evolved over the last 30 years. And I just want to reflect, if I may, on my own particular take on it and repeat some things that I said in the Kilbrandon lecture the other evening. Anybody who was there, I should begin with an apology to them for repeating points. But I think it's essential for us to have a narrative, a contextual understanding of where we are in this debate. For many years I've been arguing that the nature of neoliberalism was creating such inequality and such insecurity that eventually we would have to be able to argue that a basic income is an essential, not a desirable, but an essential response. And in 2011, I wrote a book where I tried to take from the economics and give a narrative that non-economists could understand in a book called The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. And on page one, in 2011, I said, unless the insecurities of the precariat were addressed in the very near future, a political monster would emerge. As you can imagine, in the last week to 10 days, a number of journalists have been contacting me and a number of other readers said, yes, your monster has come alive. It's no joke, of course, but sooner or later, people who face chronic insecurity and falling incomes and falling living standards, when they see what's happening elsewhere, become dysfunctionally irrational and support monsters. It's a reality of history that we should all remember. Now, in response to the precariat, which has gone global, the book's been translated into 19 languages and taken me all over the world. The last chapter was saying why we needed a basic income. And I think what's happened since 2011, because it coincided with the Occupy movement, the Indignados, the Arab Spring, is the precariat has taken shape 
And every group that I address around the world, and I've had a very strange personal journey and have spoken to over 400 meetings in 37 countries and spoken to thousands and thousands of people and received incredible deluge of emails. And you feel the pain and the anger and the reality is that more and more people understand they're part of the precarian. And more and more people are not feeling like failures or useless people, but they're feeling that they share this experience and they want to get in touch with other people and they want to do something about it. So although we're seeing some ugly political developments, we're also seeing some energy and new movements being formed. New political movements, new social movements, new consciousness that only if we revolt and make a nuisance of ourselves will change come. And I think that is a very pertinent lesson of where we are. So the second book I wrote called The Precariat Charter and by coincidence the Article 25 of the set of demands that the Charter represents is the article demanding a basic income. And in writing that book what I was trying to say was that a basic income should not be seen in isolation. It must be seen as part of a new progressive policy. And at the moment, we are in a very interesting state of the international debate because we are gaining support in surprising quarters, but we don't want to lose our main focus. When I go to the United States, and I'm going there again next week, surprisingly, there's a lot of libertarian support for basic income coming from the right. And for them, they have a very warped view of life. They want to dismantle the social state and put some sort of minimalist version of a basic income in its place. Now, we have to confront that perspective. And I say to my friends on the left, just because they are supporting it doesn't mean we should not. Don't be fooled. But at the same time, we have to confront that libertarian perspective. I don't feel defensive about it. And I don't feel that those people on the left should be running away from the idea of a basic income as part of a progressive strategy. What we have to do is confront the libertarian perspective on their own ground with confidence and say we need public services. We need voice and agency. The two great needs we have are basic income, security and voice. The one without the other is not good enough. Because if you gave a person a basic income and they had no voice in society, no agency, then very quickly the exploiters will take away their money. So it's important to see the basic income as part of a progressive strategy, when new forms of voice are part of that agenda. But after I'd written the Precariat Charter, I thought there's one little piece in the puzzle that's missing. Because we have the argument about affordability. The argument that we can't afford to have a basic income for everybody. We get it thrown at us day after day. So I said to myself, look, I've justified in my mind for the past 30 plus years 
a basic income as fundamentally about social justice. That's my primary concern. And social justice goes back to Thomas Paine in particular. Thomas Paine, in the winter of 1795, I have a feeling he was in a room that was slightly warmer than this, but he was apparently suffering from various cold problems. But he wrote an, a very important essay in which he said, words to this effect, that the land and wealth of society is far more to do with the collective efforts of our ancestors. And as it was interpreted later by people like G.D.H. Cole, we don't know whose ancestors contributed to our collective wealth. And you could say that that collective wealth does belong to all of us. And because we don't know whose contribution counted more or less, we should treat a basic income as a sort of social dividend on the collective investment of our ancestors. It's a form of rent, he said. So I came to write the third part of the trilogy, and it was meant to be a small book of about 70 to 100 pages, and several publishers had approached me and I said, I'm only going to write a small book. And they said, fine, that's what we would like. But as happens if you're an author, particularly as you get older, I suspect, is that once I got into the subject, it became a bigger book and then a bigger book. Because the argument that I'm trying to advance in this new book, which has just come out, which is called The Corruption of Capitalism, is that rentier capitalism has emerged in which instead of just land, a whole range of assets are owned or possessed or controlled by tiny minorities and our governments, successive governments, have facilitated a process by which rental income is gained by a tiny minority. So-called intellectual property, ideas, have been turned into property to give huge incomes to a minority through institutional structures, not through any hard work that people do. Subsidies by the state, huge subsidies are paid out by governments to tiny minorities. They're highly regressive. They worsen inequality, and they suck income out of the precariat. Debt mechanisms are being constructed, which f create a flow of income to the rentiers. In addition, the commons, our commons, have been plundered, commercialized, privatized, sold giving rental income to people who've never contributed to the wealth of our, our whole society. So the book grew and it became a source of anger as I wrote it. I have a few copies here if you're still interested at the end. But essentially the argument is that the same argument that advanced by Thomas Paine rental income, collective wealth, we can get our basic income from transferring the rental income into capital funds, like the Norwegians have done, like the Alaska Permanent Fund, like Scotland should have done when North Sea oil or Scottish oil was found. But we can do it with high tech, we can do it with other sources of finance and so on. That's the essence of the argument of the book. Now, I just want to say a few words about the precariat. 
Because I believe the argument that millions of people are being converted into a precariat is our strongest card. The funding you can do, as I've just been hinting at, you can work on that line. So affordability, to me, is a wrong argument. I will not accept the argument that to pay a basic income we have to dismantle our welfare system. It's not right. I do not accept the argument that to pay a basic income we have to put up taxes vastly for ordinary people. It's not right. But think about the precariat just for a moment. Millions of people are being forced to accept a life of unstable labor without a future, without an occupational identity, having to do a lot of work that doesn't get recognized in our statistics, in our remuneration system, in the political rhetoric, in textbooks. Shame on the sociologists and economists who ignore all the work that people have to do that doesn't get remunerated. In addition, if you're in the precariat, you have a level of education higher than the level of labor you're likely to get. And you will find you have to rely almost entirely on money wages. And I've been arguing in these books that for the precariat, the value of money wages in real terms in purchasing power, if you like, have been falling all over the OECD countries. Real wages on average have been stagnant over the last 30 years in the United States, in Germany, in France, in Britain. It's not a unique thing or a new thing. And we saw after the autumn statement that real wages in Britain are going to continue to flat, go flat. And don't think it will stop in 2021. There are very good reasons for thinking that real wages on average will continue to flatline and for the precariat will continue to decline. If you take that one parameter, that one contextual point, you will realize how serious the situation is. In addition, people have been losing access to benefits and services, face horrendous poverty traps, where going from low benefits into low-wage jobs mean they face a marginal tax rate of over 80%. Over 80%. And that's what the government admits to. The reality for many is it's well over 100%, damn it. That's the reality. And here we have Mr. Hammond <laughs> replacing the much forgotten Osborne, doing the same thing, promising to lower the taper from 65% to 63% for the new universal credit. That means that even on their own estimates, and I, I doubt it's anything like as low as that, you expect the precariat to pay a marginal tax rate of over 60% when your middle class and your affluent are paying less than half that. That's the reality. But Britain is not unique. It's happening in other countries as well. Now what's happening is that the precariat consists of some working class people who've fallen into it. They don't have a lot of education. They know they've lost a past. They think they've lost a past. And they don't see a future. And so they listen to the sirens of neo-fascism. And their latest standard bearer is Donald Trump. Next year it will be Marine Le Pen. Around Europe there are others, ugly creatures of an ugly past. 
And unless something like a basic income is put on the agenda to offer hope, to offer security, to offer a source of redistribution, nobody should be surprised if that part of the precariat goes on growing and growing and becomes angrier and uglier. And I think it's this reality which is leading to the fact that suddenly a lot more people are interested in basic income. Because they realize that something has to be done. And it's this sense that suddenly the basic income has become almost a political imperative that is creeping up the agenda. I'm sort of a radical lefty economist and therefore I find it extremely funny that this year I should be invited to speak to the Bilderberg group of right-wing elitists, the World Economic Forum and Davos in January. I've been asked to give two speeches in Davos. Now, I'm just hoping I won't lose too many friends because going to places like that doesn't mean that suddenly they like my face. They're suddenly running scared. And we're going to see a lot more people in the liberal center or among corporates who are going to be suddenly advocates. I'm convinced of that. Now, I want just to spend a few minutes, if I may, on the arguments for a basic income. In the discussion afterwards, we can consider the standard objections, the standard advantages that we've discussed. They're enunciated in the books and elsewhere. Annie Miller's got a new book coming out She'll be enunciating, I'm sure, the same sort of advantages as I am I'm doing. But the fundamental justifications of a basic income, and you and we should all remember this, is not sort of pragmatic. We should try and keep to the high ground. The first argument is social justice, as I've discussed. Social justice. Let me give one example. I was invited to present the precariat in Middlesbrough. And when I went to Middlesbrough, I was taken around the town. Middlesbrough, if you remember or know, is somewhat like Glasgow in the role it's played. Middlesbrough was a little village in 1820 and they suddenly found iron ore there. And within 20 years, it became the center of the Industrial Revolution, the center of the British Empire, with steel, gate, Iron Gate Bridge in San Francisco, the Golden State Bridge, or whatever it's called, I forget. It was built with iron ore from Middlesbrough. The Sydney Bridge was built, the iron ore from Middlesbrough. The railway system in India is built with iron ore from Middlesbrough, a tiny side around. If you go to Middlesbrough today, you see derelict buildings, houses blocked up with concrete, little gardens overgrown with weeds. You see people hanging around on street corners and you realize, of course, that these are the descendants of the people who created the wealth of Britain, of you, the whole part of all our country. Go to Glasgow and you will see the same things. Many communities like that. And yet in places like the southeast of England, the Toffs, who are descendants of the toffs who made the money 
are living life of fantastic luxury. The precariat of Middlesbrough's, many of them, have nothing. And of course, you go back to the Paynean argument when you see such communities, you realize the injustice that exists. But the second argument for a basic income is that it would enhance freedom. It's very important that those of us who propose basic income emphasize the freedom enhancing properties of a basic income. The only way you can expect a human being to be a responsible citizen is if they have the adequate resources to be able to make decisions rationally. And you can only be moral if you have the capacity to make such decisions and are not being told what to do by some bureaucracy or some authority figure. That's the standard liberal view of freedom. But I also believe in republican freedom. Freedom in a republican sense means that you are free of the prospect of unaccountable domination by figures in bureaucracies, authorities. And you can only have that if you have basic security to be able to say no. If you can't say no, then you haven't got Republican freedom. And Republican freedom means having security on your own terms. And you can only do that with a basic income. You can't do it with means-tested social assistance. You can't do it with workfare or reliance on charity. Charity is equivalent to pity, contempt. But you don't have freedom if you have to rely on charity. A basic income enhances freedom. And one of the arguments that I've drawn out of our pilots in India and Africa, basic income pilots, is that the emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value because it allows people to make decisions rationally and sequentially and to take a long-term perspective to life. You can't do that unless you've got basic income security. And that leads to the third big justification which is that a basic income deals effectively with poverty, or can do. It can reduce inequality. But more important than either of those things, a basic income provides people with a sense of security. A sense of psychological security. Because you have an assured source of resources today and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And that sense of security has been shown by psychologists to lead to what's called a wider mental bandwidth. Technical term, they love technical terms. But you can get the point very easily. People who have security have a better sense of control of their mind. They can make decisions more rationally. They can make decisions with less stress. Vital, you would have thought, vital. And you'd have thought that every progressive political movement would give such feelings a very, very high priority. And yet, all our political parties in the past 30 years have given it scant respect. Let us call it zero respect. So they've allowed millions and millions of people to have growing security, insecurity and have even boasted about it. 
I can give you numerous quotations from leading politicians who say people must be more scared. But if they're more scared, they'll, they'll get up and work harder, blah, 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 blah. What sort of mentality is it that you want your citizens to go around feeling scared all the time? Or insecure? I mean, what sort of mentality is that? We should mock them. Tell them to flip off, or stronger words. Now, this sense of security goes with freedom and it goes with social justice. And we should always advance the cause of basic income through our values, through our high principles. And we must not be diverted into the mechanics. Yes, the mechanics are important. I'm not, not saying they're not. How we get there from here is a huge problem. But when you're setting up a new vibrant network, the most important thing is to get your values established. And the values are what are motivating the progressive part of the precariat. Because the young educated coming out of university who are looking for a politics of paradise are motivated by the same things that all of us were when we were 21 or whatever. And those values we can espouse better than anybody else. That's how I feel a basic income is rolling down the main street into increasing relevance. Now what we've found with our pilots, and I've got copy of the book, Our Pilots in India, on which I will end. When we started our pilots in India, everybody, including many mutual friends of Annie and myself, said, Guy, a basic income in a rich country is feasible, but you can't possibly have a basic income in low-income countries. Crazy. And suddenly the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, the young women in that association, said, why don't we try it here in India? So we gave 6,000 people in nine communities, everybody in those communities, a basic income for 18 months and compared what happened to them with what happened to others, 6,000 people, who were not receiving a basic income, but were otherwise in similar circumstances. It's aged me a lot because we had to get the political support, we had to get the local bureaucracies to just allow it to happen, we had to get an awareness in the whole of a large part of India that we were doing it, we had to convince Sonia Gandhi that that we weren't mad, although she was scornful and said, they're all going to waste it on alcohol and tobacco, you're wasting your money. But we did the pilot, and anybody who's interested, the book's there and we've got videos. I'll briefly summarize what happened. And I'm sure the results will stagger you, very surprising, you know, very surprising. The first thing that happened was that the nutrition of the children improved. Weight for age improved, malnutrition declined. And what was beautiful was that the malnutrition of the girl children improved more than for the boys because they were more malnourished at the beginning. But it was a beautiful outcome. The second thing that happened was sanitation was improved and health care and health improved. And surprisingly, when the health of the children improved, their nutrition improved and their schooling improved. I'm sure this is all staggering to most of you in this room. And school attendance went up, school registration went up, and school performance improved. Again, Delightful to see 
that for teenagers, the improvements were greater for girls than for boys because they had been further behind in the past. So the welfare effects of the basic income are out there. In addition, the equity effects came through. What this means is if you give everybody a basic income, the people who benefit disproportionately are people like the disabled. Women compared with men, the elderly frail compared with others, the lower castes compared with the upper castes. So it, it reduced inequities in those communities. The third thing that happened, again, contrary to what all of the bureaucrats and the politicians and the, the advisors from the IMF and some, so on were saying, is that the amount of work went up the amount of work and labor went up of every single group, including the fact that women suddenly had access to own account activities and were doing activities that gave them a sense of independence. There was only one group for which labor went down. It was shocking, truly shocking. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do with this negative result. The only group for which labor went down with children. Sorry about that. Can't have everything. Now, the work went up, and we found the same in Africa. We found the same in other, other experiments. And it's an argument that we must never let our critics win. People who have basic security work more, not less. They escape from the poverty traps. They have more energy. They have more confidence. They want to improve their lives, damn it. So they work with more confidence, with more entrepreneurial vigor. In addition, we saw own account activities, and we saw income distribution improve in those communities. Economic output up inequality down. Not bad. The fourth effect was that the emancipatory value, as I said earlier, came through much more than the amount of money we were providing would have suggested. And that was because people were using the money themselves. We weren't telling them how to use them. It's up to them. No advice, nothing from us. But they were using it to break constraints like debt bondage, like cultural barriers. And I'll end by just mentioning two examples. One from these villages and one from Africa that I mentioned the other day, from our pilot in Namibia. When we started the pilot in one of those villages, we noticed that all the young women were wearing veils. And we had to have their picture taken, and we asked them, please, we need your picture because you've got to have your card to get the basic income each month. They wouldn't take their veils off, so they had to have their picture taken in a hut. We did that. About seven, eight months later, when I came to that particular village, I suddenly looked around and I said to an Indian colleague working with me, I said, have you noticed some change here? And he said, no, no, no. I said, yes, look again, look again. He said, ah, oh. I said, none of the women are wearing veils. None of them are wearing veils. So we called some of the women across, and when they came across, they said, oh, <laughs> we asked them, why are you not wearing veils? Uh, they wouldn't give it an answer, oh, no. <laughs> very shy. But then one of them spoke up and said, you know, before, we used to have to do what the elders told us to do. 
Now we have our own money. It's not much, but we have our own money. We can make our decisions ourselves. That's emancipation. The case in Namibia, at the end of the pilot, I was in one of the villages and called three teenage women across. And I asked a sort of innocent question. I said, what is the best thing for you about having had a basic income? Giggles. Teenagers always giggle when confronted with foreigners. Don't blame them. And uh, then one of them plucked up courage to say. She said, you know, before we had the basic income, when the men used to come down from the fields at the end of the month with their money, their wages, we had to say yes. Now we say no. That's emancipation. A basic income would work in different ways, whether it was in, a, in Fife, where we were yesterday, where we may see a pilot, we hope, and, or in Glasgow or wherever. In different ways, but essentially the same human motivations will come to the front. And we must defeat the cynics, the, the skeptics, because unless we have a basic income, our societies are going to degenerate into a competitive free-for-all in which the Donald Trumps will thrive. Our agenda is more important now than it's ever been. So I want to wish you every possible success. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know about you, but I found that incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much, Guy. It's the second time I've heard you speak, and um, both times have been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. And as you can hear, I'm quite overcome. I'm very passionate about this cause, and I hope that those of you in the room are, and I absolutely agree we must defeat the skeptics. So we now have, to, and I did let Guy overrun because I thought it was necessary and important. So don't worry about the timings. We've got plenty of time. Um, so now it's your turn to ask questions of Guy, and um, we'll just take it as they come. Now, I've got the mic here, which means that, um, Guy, I'm afraid you might have to stand up again to take questions um, with the mic. So can I give the um, mic to you, Mike? <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Fraser Shaw, uh, I'm a doctor, specialist in addictions uh, and an academic at Stirling Uni as well. Um, first thing is, uh, just quickly to say, I think everyone in the room thought when you said you were going to go to Dallas, be careful you don't get shot, right? So, please. Davos. Davos. Da oh, I thought you said Dallas. No, Davos. Oh, well, that's all right. Don't get shot there either. No, I, I was thinking about going to the USA, though, is, is a scary thing at the moment, right? Um, no, the question was, um, what, I presume you've found it easier because you've been able to do this, the, the, to, to undertake the pilots in the third world in Africa, India, and so on. Why do you think it's been possible to do them there and, and as opposed to the, the first world? Obviously, you, you're planning to do it, but why has it panned out that way, do you think? Uh, shall I answer that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I cut short my talk because I was well aware I was, I'd overrun my, my time. One of the themes that I talked about the other evening in the Kill Brandon was that I'm calling this the year of the pilots, 2016. Because suddenly, doing pilot basic income schemes has become sexy. 
And we've got in Finland, the Prime Minister of Finland has come out saying they want to do a pilot in Finland, put money aside. We've been dragged into advising on the design. 25 municipalities of the Netherlands have announced they're going to do pilot basic income schemes. The French province, it hasn't been announced yet, but of, of Aquitaine, the local authorities have voted to do a pilot there. Ontario, the province of Ontario in Canada, has announced it's going to do a pilot in Ontario and put money aside, the Premier of Ontario. And among others, I'm being invited to California next week where Y Combinator, it's called, a venture fund. The man who's in charge of that, a billionaire, he's put up $20 million for doing a pilot in Oakland, and they're asking me across to advise on the design. Many of these schemes in rich industrialized schemes, uh, countries, are predicated on a perspective that they think the robots are coming. You know, they think that robots are going to displace all of us and the, they need to think forward. Now, I personally don't buy that argument, but I do think that technological changes are worsening the inequality because they're providing more and more income. They are disruptive. And the fact that these characters are backing a basic income because they think the robots are coming, I say, fine, fine, I don't care what you think, as long as you support basic income, you know. So we're in a stage where, for various reasons, pilots are suddenly becoming. Now we all, any of us who are working in this area know that pilots aren't perfect. For one thing, they can only be temporary. You know, they very, so obviously they're not the equivalent of a basic thing. But they can help us debunk certain views about conditionality, about targeting, about means testing, and the, the, we can gradually defeat the, the skeptics. And I think pilots are doing that. Plus, the behavioral prejudices, you know? The, the pilots that have been done by accident in North Carolina uh, with Cherokee Indians. It's a, it's a very, very interesting pilot that where the local casino suddenly distributed a basic income for all members of the Cherokee community at the same time as the 20 year uh, longitudinal study was being done of that community and other communities about child development. And that has helped debunk certain arguments. I think pilots can do that. And every single pilot so far has debunked the classic criticism of basic income that it will make people lazy. There is no evidence that I know of that providing people with a basic income leads to any increase in laziness. Actually, I, I like laziness. I would like some laziness, but, but that's not the point. That it, there is no evidence that a basic income leads to a massive reduction in work. That's the sort of thing that pilots can help with. They can start clearing the decks of prejudiced views. And we, yesterday we were in Fife and early days for the negotiations in various parts of Scotland, but it would be fantastic if some sort of pilot were launched in Scotland. Is there anybody else who has a question at this point? Yes. Um, so, um, I'd, like, I'd like to ask you a question. So, I'm Neil McKegany, and I write about sort of drug use and, so, and various related matters. And I can see from what you said that um, it's a very revolutionary proposal, actually. Um, but in more than simple terms, it's revolutionary because it does seem to me that 
there is a considerable amount that could be achieved by an assured basic income for those who need it. And I think that that notion is, is truly revolutionary because there is a hot, there is, there is, seems to be so many judgments written into the process through which those who need a basic income, even if it's not assured, uh, are able to attain it. And it's a precarious circumstance to be in. And I can see that considerable benefit can come from the removal of that precarious element. And that can be achieved by an assured basic income. But it seems to me, as I, at least as I understand it, that it's a revolutionary proposal in another way as well, which is that you are proposing giving a basic income to people who don't need it. And I'm genuinely puzzled as to what the justification for giving people who have more than adequate resources even more income. I, I'm puzzled that such a proposal to give both the wealthy and the needy additional income is a proposal to narrow inequality because it seems to me in, in at least some sense to increase inequality. And finally, it seems to me that if it's a proposal, the feasibility of which is at least determined in part by the answer to the question, can we afford it? Surely, one would have to conclude that we are in a position to be more able to afford it if we're not giving income to people who already have a surplus of it. That, uh, that would suggest something rather different than a basic uh, citizen income, some level of targeting. But I, I just don't see how one would not wish to target if one wished to avoid a situation where those who already have excess are to be given more. I entirely accept the proposal to provide an assured basic income to those who don't have a uh, surplus and, uh, and excess. So it might seem that I'm a skeptic, but I'm a skeptic only in the sense that I can't see the true justification of giving those who have more than enough even more, whilst I entirely accept the, the, the imperative, and I agree with you, I think it is becoming more imperative, not less imperative, to give those who don't have enough uh, an assured basic income. Let, let me give you a brief answer to that. It's a, it's a subject we discuss at length in my books and elsewhere quite a lot. The best way of starting the counter critique of that position is to recall a remark made by Richard Titmus, who was one of the founding fathers of the welfare state after the Second World War. And he said, that benefits that are only for the poor are invariably poor benefits. And there's a very good tradition of understanding of that. If you go to means testing, targeting on the poor, you've got to identify the poor. And not only got to identify the poor, but you've got to then identify the deserving poor. Because some people may choose to be poor through, you know, their laziness or something, okay? You then have to set up means testing, which are invariably, and without exception, stigmatizing. They lead to huge, what we call type 1 and type 2 errors, statistical terms, but mainly people who should be receiving don't receive. And some people who should not be receiving, according to the criteria, end up receiving. And the administrative costs of doing that, as well as the stigmatizing effect of doing that, mean that a lot of people never apply for benefits for which, to which they're entitled. My own father was a working class man, out of pride, just out of pride when he needed it. He didn't, he didn't apply for benefits because he just felt shame. It's not something I do. And you can, you can respect that pride. I love him for it. But 
He was penalizing himself, but he, there are many, many, many millions of people who know what that means. It's actually much better to give a universal basic income and then tax it with a high rate of tax, if you wish. Well, I, I do wish, but that's a political decision. So you, you actually get it out and you're going to have 100% or nearly 100% take up because it's a right. You then remove the poverty trap at the bottom because you say your basic income is non-withdrawable. In other words, you get it. And then any earned income, you start paying at the standard rate of tax. So you don't have the poverty trap of the 80%, you have 30% or whatever it might be. So you have actually greater incentive for people to go for low wage jobs because they're going to retain a higher percentage of the earned income that they get from doing those jobs. So for me, that the argument is, is that it won't increase in inequality because you actually get it out. The people receive it. And the current situation is that huge numbers of the very poorest in our society, the very most insecure, are those that are not getting the entitlements to which they, they have a due. But for me, it's a, it's a non-brainer. But I perfectly understand the, 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 you know, the idea that you're, you're expressing. So I'll be brief. Um, I just want to check a sound, take a sounding from you because there's about six of you that put up question, um, put your hands up for questions, um, and I'd like to take them all. But can I just check in with you? We want to have table discussions where many of the questions you may be asking of Guy, you can also ask of each other and then you can share later. So I want to strike a deal. Can I take one more question now? And then we will go to table discussion. And you can see from the program that we have feedback and more discussion this afternoon, but that will be informed by your further discussion here. Does that sound okay? Otherwise, unless you want to stay till four o'clock. Um, how do you feel? Okay. So. I, there were about six of you. I'm going to just have to take, I think I'll take a woman this time, because I don't think we've had a woman. So um, can you raise your hand? Um, there's, um, let's go at the back there. There's a young woman at the back, Mike, and uh, we'll take one more question. Should take two, because we haven't had any women, so you should have at least two. Oh, I will, I promise. Yeah? Okay. Um, thanks. Well, thanks to everybody who let me ask the question. Um, I was quite reassured by the, the whole, um, you know, like, where, where does the money come from? It comes from historical like, plundering of the commons, and it's um, because, like, my, uh, my worry is um, if uh, that the basic income movement needs to also look at the ecological limits to growth that the basic income doesn't become an imperative for growing the economy even more because we can't afford to ecologically with you know, climate change and so on ha happening um, so uh, yeah so I'd be interested to to hear some some comments from that and uh, about that and also about um, that uh, um, another worry would be that um, the that that there would be a lot of fear around um, um, immigration um, with the basic income, that um, it would sort of feed into this whole Brexit, Trump, immigration paranoia of like, oh, oh if we've got a basic income, then we'd be flooded with, Im with immigrants. Um, and how, how can we counter... So I'm basically just looking for good arguments to, to counter these sort of narratives based around fear and, and how to link it in with environmental concerns. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, let me. You, you've asked two very different questions, and very, very close to my heart. I, I, I'm a bit more name dropping. Apologies for that in advance. But I was asked to address the World Economic Forum recently, and I found all these chief executives there, and the man sitting next to me was Al Gore. And I was talking like this, and at the end, 
he got up and he said, I think I, I, I agree with all you're saying, but I'm not sure about basic income. I'm going to rethink it. And I said to him in response, I said, well, look, one of the great things about a basic income is it, it encourages people to do work that is not labor. The work of caring, the work of community activity, the work of doing different charity, voluntary work, things that are not part of labor. Labor is resource depleting. It uses up resources and therefore it must have a polluting cost and threaten the ecology. Whereas work, in the broader sense, which is encouraged by a basic income, includes the reproductive, the conservatory, conserving sort of work. It wants to preserve nature, resources. It gives you a chance, what I call a slow time movement, where we indulge in our work. And I think that that is a powerful argument going forward. The precariat groups always understand this argument. Women's groups should always, obviously. So I think that that part of our, that debate is a very strong card for basic income supporters. The last point about migration, and I deal with it in the books because obviously that is a, a, a big argument issue. The irony is that our current means-tested systems are actually f creating anti-migrant sentiments because they're based on saying that the people who are the poorest get to the front of the queue and we're doing means testing and that means who is the most impoverished? It's the migrants, it's the people who've just arrived in the community. So it gives the appearance of saying we favor those who are just coming in because they're the poorest, they have the most needs. And therefore, it excites a sense of resentment by people who've been in the, in the community for generations. Now, I don't think it's fair to condemn those people if they have anti-migrant sentiments in those circumstances. The great thing about a basic income is you say basically your citizens and the people who've had legal residence here are first in the queue. And then you can have rules, pragmatic rules, saying that you have to be a legal resident in Glasgow or wherever for a certain period before you become entitled to the basic income. And you deal with the refugee and the migrant issues and the need for support for those groups separately. And that will help with the legitimation of income support for people in insecurity. For me, it's the current system that's that's a cause, a cause, of the anti-migrant sentiment. Thank you very much.